Welcome to Hope for Right Now, a Walking with Purpose podcast. Walking with Purpose is a Catholic women's apostolate that creates fresh and relevant Bible studies to lead women to personally know Christ through Scripture. Hi, I'm Lisa Brennickmeyer, and I'm joined by Laura Phelps. We are two friends passionate about unpacking God's Word and applying it to our everyday lives. Each week, we will step out of the discouragement the world provides by grabbing hold of the hope we find in God's Word. Never have we been more convinced of the importance of women being grounded in hope. No matter where you are in the spiritual journey, we pray you'll stick around because God has a word for your heart and his word changes everything. So open your heart, open your Bible and invite God in. Hello and welcome back to the Hope for Right Now podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Brennickmeyer. And I'm your other host, Laura Phelps, and today we are starting a new eight-week series, and I'm so excited. It's called Be Strong, the Armor of God. We're going to be diving into Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. So Lisa, can you start us off by explaining why you chose the Armor of God as our next series? Sure. So I think I'm really, really excited about this topic for starters, and I think this is such an important topic for us to discuss because I believe... I really believe there's a level of victory and empowerment that is available to each one of us, but it often ends up unused. And so what this series is going to do is it's going to give us an opportunity to take a step back and to start looking at our circumstances through a different lens. Because I don't know about you, Laura, and you listeners, but my default focus is always on what is right in front of me, what I can see. So the problems that are right in front of my eyes. And then my response to this, I always start to think about what can I do? What can I say? What can I control? What can I fix? Um, But there is a different perspective, which I need to discipline myself to switch over to every single day. And it's this, that there is actually an invisible spiritual battle that rages around me, that I cannot opt out of it. I am in it because of my relationship to Christ. And, And this is key. And this is what this series is about. I have been given and you have been given supernatural spiritual armor, which is a game changer in this battle. But for us to benefit from it, we need to know what it is. We've got to put it on. And then we have to do the one most important thing, the thing that activates it. And I'm going to share what that is right at the end of this episode. So I hope you stay with us. But Laura, why don't you start us off by reading the verses from Ephesians that we're going to be studying together throughout this whole series. Sure, I'd love to. So we are in Ephesians. Remember, it's chapter 6, and we're looking at verses 10 through 18. And we read, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the equipment of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you can quench all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Okay, so this passage packs a punch, (laughs) so full of truth. And Lisa, what do you want to focus on today? Well, for our time together today, just want to start by honing in on verse 12, which says, For we are not contending against flesh and blood but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So this verse is starting out by telling us that we should expect to struggle. 
And so other translations, this one says, you know, we're going to struggle against these powers. Others say we're going to wrestle with these powers. And it describes this battle as a fact, not as something that we can opt out of or avoid. We are in it, whether we want to be or not. And like I said earlier, we're in it because of our relationship to Jesus. So we want to know everything we can know about this battle. And one thing is that there are always three agents at play in everything that happens on earth. So God is always at work. Then there is always humanity. That's us. And there's a third player on the stage, the enemy. And many people, I think what gets tricky is we are thinking that what's real is only what we see with our eyes. But this verse is telling us that our struggle is not with flesh and blood. And by that, that's, you know, people that we can see, but with principalities, with powers, with world rulers of this present darkness, with evil spirits in the heavens. So this is describing a spiritual realm that we don't see with our eyes. This is why it can be really tricky because our enemy and those who work with him, they're invisible, right? They operate in a realm that's spiritual. So we don't see them, but what we do see is the people and the problems that are right in front of us. And so that tends to be what we focus on. So we think things like, well, the problem's my husband, or the problem's my finances, or this health issue, or that issue at work, or that person at work. And while each one of those things, those circumstances, those people can be really frustrating, really, really difficult, what is really going on is something behind the scenes. And if we just focus on those surface things, we're going to actually miss the real issue. And I heard a great illustration about this from Bible teacher Priscilla Shire, and she described going to a harvest festival with her son and kids were playing little carnival games. And one of those games, I'm going to try and describe what it was like. It was like almost like a table, but there were holes in the top of it. And the point of the game was to whack little puppets as they popped up randomly out of the holes, kind of like whack-a-mole, like if you can picture that game. So a little four-year-old boy was playing and he got so frustrated that the minute you hit one puppet, another one popped up. So you just like never came to the end. There was always something. And so what he did was he reached down and he yanked away the curtain that was hiding what was under the table. And what everybody saw was that there were adults sitting under that table with their hands in the puppets. And so the point was, obviously, that hitting the puppets wasn't enough because the real action was coming from underneath. And she made the point that our enemy is like the adult sitting behind the curtain. And he loves it when we just focus on the puppets. So we use our words and we whack a puppet. We do our best to control a situation and we whack a puppet. But we aren't getting to the real issue. We aren't getting to the bottom of things because our perspective isn't seeing things as they really are. So that's, I think, a really important thing for us to know and to remember about the spiritual battle is that our enemy is invisible, but that doesn't mean that we can't pull back the curtain. We can. And when we do, when we learn a little something about who our enemy is, then we're better able to engage in that spiritual battle. I think it's a great visual. I think it's like the perfect visual because first of all, like I'm just imagining myself at the carnival with my kids with those kinds of games and it's definitely the enemy is behind it. But it's a great reminder, Lisa. It's a great reminder you just gave us that there really is always more to the story, right? Like there's always more than what our eyes see. And my confessor actually one time told me that every time I think I'm I'm wrestling or in battle with somebody, like you said, like it's my spouse or it's a child or a friend or a coworker, he said, always assume that my feelings are wrong and to remember who the real enemy is, right? Like remember who is behind it all. So I love that. I love that. And I also think like, I'd love to say like, before we dive in, I just want to make it clear, like the conversations that we're going to have over the next eight weeks, they're not going to be about evil as a concept, right? I think like far too many Christians right now, I think we believe that Satan's just a representative of evil. And that's untrue. That's untrue. The enemy is an actual active being, right? And, and I'm not making this up. You can look it up in the catechism. It says, in this petition, evil is not an abstraction, but refers to a person, Satan, the evil one, the angel who opposes God. The devil is the one who throws himself across God's plan and his work of salvation accomplished in Christ. So that's what the catechism says. And so, you know, who is the enemy? Well, Satan was an angel. 
He was an angel. Lucifer was his name, actually, which is light bearer in Latin, which I find fascinating when you contrast that with Jesus being the true light. And um, according to two Old Testament passages, it's Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, and also Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 through 19. According to these two passages, Lucifer was the highest ranking angel, right? Like he was the best and he was not only incredibly powerful, but according to Ezekiel 28, 12 to 15, he was the most beautiful of all of God's creations. Can you imagine? Like the most beautiful of all of God's creations. And so you just have to say, what happened? <laughs> like what happened? And in short, he didn't like his job. <laughs> He didn't like his job. He wanted a better position because he didn't want to be second to God. He wanted to be God himself. And so really it's envy and pride that are believed to have been the cause of his fall. And where did he land? Well, us. He landed with us, right? He's prowling around the world, seeking the ruin of souls. And I just, I find this whole topic really, really, um, I don't want to say fascinating, but just it's so important. And it's actually the very first book I wrote, which was shameless plug, Everyday Battles and How to Win Them. But I wrote it because this was really born out of my awakening to the spiritual battle that I was personally experiencing. I think for years, I don't think I know for years, I lived totally unaware that there was a battle around me, that I was in it. And there's a great quote from the book. It's called Dynamics of Spiritual Life. It's written by Lovelace. And it says, quote, most of the devil's advantage depends on the ability to move among human affairs undetected, unquote. And so I knew that God existed, right? I knew God existed. I knew he had a plan for my life. But what I really didn't know, Lisa, was that Satan fully existed, too. And that his plan was to keep me from living out God's plan. I mean, the truth is we do have an enemy and we have an enemy who hates us. He hates us. And that's because God loves us and because we have been made in the image and likeness of God. And I love how scripture reveals his character to us by the titles that he's given. Okay, so Satan, he's referred to as a tempter in Matthew 4.3. He's called the ruler of the demons in Matthew 12, 24, the God of this age in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the evil one in 1 John 5, 18, a roaring lion in 1 Peter 5, 8, and the father of lies. He's called a murderer from the beginning in John 8, 44. And so I don't know. I find that kind of fascinating. I know that people, Lisa, they don't like to talk about the devil. (laughs) They just don't. They don't. (laughs) People don't like to talk about the devil. They don't like to talk about spiritual warfare. We'd rather pretend it it just doesn't exist and not acknowledge it. But I'm really glad that we are. I'm I'm really, really excited for this series. Um, There's a great quote from J.I. Packer who said concerning the devil and spiritual warfare, he said, quote, the Christian's life is not a bed of roses. It's a battlefield on which he is constantly to fight for his life. The first rule of success in war is knowing your enemy, end quote. Mm. Yeah, I think that's so critical that we know all that we can know about who we are up against and that we know all that we can know about the battle. This is one of those cases where ignorance is not bliss. It actually really makes it hard for us to, to step out, armored up the way that God wants us to be. And there's another passage of scripture. We're going to spend our time during the series in Ephesians 6, but there's another really important passage in the New Testament that's also written by St. Paul. That's 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. And it really helps us to understand something else about the supernatural, otherworldly aspect of this battle that we face. And that verse says, for though we live in the world, we are not carrying on a worldly war. For the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every proud obstacle to the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. So a war is being described here, and it's between two dominions, two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. These are 
two powerful kingdoms, but they are not two equal kingdoms. One kingdom is stronger than the other. That's God's kingdom, just so you know. That's the good news. <laughs> but when our enemy, the devil, went to war against us, he did have a significant victory early on. And that victory occurred when man believed the devil's lie. And the lie was that God isn't good, that God is holding out on you. And when the enemy scored that victory, two things happened. First of all, sin entered the world. And secondly, our race, so humankind, sold itself into slavery. And what that means is that apart from Christ, we are actually enslaved to powers and dominions that we cannot fight against. We are helpless against them. We are not strong enough to rescue ourselves. What this means and what this series now is going to be really delving into is we need supernatural protection that can only come from God and supernatural weapons that can only come from God. And those are the weapons that are being described in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And there are two things that I want to point out about this passage, which is one of my favorites in scripture. One is about the weapons described here, and the other is about what they have power to do. So like we said earlier, we can do battle in a lot of different ways. We can use our words. We can plan. We can try to control things. And that's the equivalent of hitting the puppets. And sometimes things do get better, but the problems don't go away. And what 2 Corinthians 10 is saying is that we've got weapons that can actually do battle under the curtain. They can actually be aimed at our real enemy. And so we are going to learn about those weapons in this series because those weapons can operate under the curtain. And what they can do is take down strongholds. That is what we're reading about in 2 Corinthians 10. Stronghold, okay, so that is not an everyday word that we use, um, but the people that Paul was writing to knew exactly what it meant because many cities in those days had a stronghold or a fortress, and it was a building that was at the highest point of the city. And if there was a battle, that is where people would run for safety because it was the best place to hide. It was, it was the safest place. So they would run there for security and safety. And this is really, really interesting because of the application it has in our own lives. We may not have an area in town that's at the highest point where we run when we're afraid or we want to be secure. What we do is we construct strongholds in our lives ourselves. So when we feel threatened, we have things that we have constructed and we run there. We go to those places instead of going to God. And in that moment, we choose to rely on ourselves rather than him. So when I fear failure, that's something I struggle with. I might construct a stronghold of perfectionism. It's not just that I might, I do. Like this is, that's, that's one of my strongholds that I've really had to do spiritual work to break down. Um, when I'm experiencing overwhelming emotions, I might construct a stronghold of denial. You can construct a stronghold of escape through alcohol, through drug use. When I fear that I can't control circumstances in my life, I might develop an excessive need to control some area of my life so I could construct a stronghold of anorexia or bulimia, controlling my eating. There, there are just as many different examples of strongholds as there are areas in our lives where we struggle, right? The problem with the stronghold is that we construct it at the beginning thinking that we are increasing our security. We think we're making ourselves feel better. We think we're taking the edge off. We think that we are in control, right? This is something we're doing so that we are in control and we feel better. But what ends up happening is that the stronghold begins to master us. We start out constructing the stronghold and find later that it is actually holding us in bondage. So we thought self-reliance would be the key to our safety, and we were wrong. This, this happens time and time again in our lives. And so to destroy a stronghold like this, we need immense strength, more strength, frankly, than we possess. But the really good news is that the weapons that were given by God actually have divine power, divine power that can break down these strongholds. And this is what we're going to be exploring in this series on the armor of God. 
So Laura, I'd love to know what you think about that, how that hits you. And, and especially what you think about the second part of that passage from second Corinthians 10, that our weapons can actually destroy arguments and every pretension raising itself up against the knowledge of God. What is that talking about? Mm, gosh, that's so good. Well, you know, all sorts of arguments and lies, ultimately they just seek to draw us away from what we know to be true about God, right? So the lies, they're whispered, and then the seeds of doubts, that, that's all that's sown, right? And our trust in God then is eroded. And so then that's when we start to seek security in things other than him. And the amazing thing about this is that this happens without our even deciding to let our thoughts run along that path. You know what I mean? And so we really, we have to discipline ourselves. We have to develop a different mindset. I think it's a good thing if we just sort of stop and ask ourselves, you know, based on our knowledge of God, what do we know to be true of him? Right? We struggle with the lie that we're alone. But then we could say, yes, but we know that he never leaves us or forsakes us. If, if we struggle with the lie that we're unlovable, we can say, but no, we know he loves us unconditionally right? We can struggle with the lie that we are powerless and hopeless. And yet we know he is all powerful and promises to come through for us. So you see that the amazing thing, Lisa, is all of these thoughts can be in our minds at the same time. <laughs> like This is why we're all crazy, by the way. <laughs> like This all goes on all at the same time. It's a lie when people say you could only have one thought at a time. Untrue, untrue. All of these go through our mind at the same time, both the truth and the lies. And so what we need to do is really, it's found at the end of the passage, right? It's that last verse. We need to take every thought captive in obedience to Christ. We have to do this. And so, you know, what does that look like? Well, okay, so say a thought comes into your mind. Instead of playing around with it, which we love to do, right? following it down a rabbit trail. What if, if only, right? Instead of doing that, we need to grab it and then hold it up to the light. And then we need to compare it to the truth of scripture. And if it is consistent with the truth of scripture, well, then great. We keep the thought. But if it isn't, toss it out. It's a lie, right? I learned this from you, Lisa. This is taking a thought captive to Christ. But the only way that we can do this is if we recognize truth in the voice of the Father, right? There's like no shortcut here. You must absolutely put in the time and discipline yourself to saturate your mind in Scripture. That's it. And, and I'm guilty of this. I really am. I will fall out of the practice and then wonder why I'm like losing my mind. It's because I'm not putting in the work. I'm not going back to Scripture. And this is where God is speaking most clearly in Scripture. That's his most clear speaking. I am not saying that he does not speak to us in other ways. He most certainly does. But nowhere are we going to find a more condensed gathering of our father's thoughts and our heart towards us, right? Like we've got to put in the work. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things we're going to see with the armor of God. It's one of our pieces of armor. Um, the importance of the sword is the spirit, which is scripture. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to actually learn how to wield it, how to do exactly what you're talking about. But for today, just with this high level um, view of the spiritual battle that we're starting with, I want us to just remember a couple things that one, this battle is unavoidable and two, our real enemy is invisible. But just because we can't see him is not to say we can't get a little more savvy about his tactics and we can do the work of aiming our strategies and our weapons at him instead of at the people in our lives who seem like they are the main problem. And for some of us, the people who seem like they are the main issue are people really close to us, as in our families. But it can also happen with people who we aren't close to at all. And I just think about just the politically polarized times that we live in. And I don't even need to expand on that because we're all living in it and you all know what I'm talking about. We're all experiencing it. And all too often, tribalism is keeping people on both sides in echo chambers where we're really only listening deeply and open, openly to those who agree with us. And I just think this is incredibly damaging. I don't know. It's, it's like we've become afraid to listen. And instead of listening, what we do is we label, we assume, and we're filled with suspicion, and we have got a lot of anger 
And again, this is the case on both sides of the political divide. And so what ends up happening is that it doesn't take much for us to start looking at people as the enemy instead of recognizing there are spiritual powers at work and in play here. So in this series, what we're going to be wanting to do is shedding light on the spiritual battle that we are all in by unpacking Ephesians 6. And we're going to look at each piece of the armor of God and learn, first of all, how we can be better equipped for the battle, but then at the same time, how to walk this all out while being wise and loving and humble in our dealings with people, because both those things are really, really important. Oh my gosh. I can't wait, Lisa. I am so excited. I need this so badly. And I'm going to pray that our listeners are just as excited as we are and ready to do the work, right? Like let's do this work. And y'all, if you're not in our Facebook, our private Facebook group, come and join us because I, I know Lisa, like we're enjoying those conversations and that discussion there so much. And honestly, like that's where a lot of that work can happen. So as always, we want to give you some journaling questions to sort of um reflect on. And so we mentioned three lies that the enemy loves to whisper, right? To mess with our minds. And these three lies were, I am alone. I am unlovable. I am powerless and hopeless. Do you find that any of these lies take up space in your head? Or, or do you have a different lie? Do you have a different lie? Well, whatever the lie is, we want you to write the lie down. And then we want you to take some time to journal the truth you know about God. So you might want to journal some Bible verses here. And if you don't know them off the top of your head, Google is our friend. <laughs> Just Google Bible verses about God's goodness or Bible, you know, Bible verses about God's love for us or his provision, something like that. Or just journal the past times that the God that God has come through for you. That'll work too. Really, the point here, we want to start to replace the lies with the truth. That's the point. And, and I just want to say that if this is an area where you want to grow, I highly recommend our Bible study, Fearless and Free. This is a study that was put in my hands at a time that I was in serious battle and I really, I didn't know it and I didn't know how to fight it. And I cannot even tell you how much this changed my life. You just, you just need to get it. If you haven't done Fearless and Free, highly recommend. Yeah, I do too. It's my favorite. And it's a great way to... um just work these things out, just thinking of your own story. And um, yeah, it's just a step-by-step -step way of working through a lot of this. And I'd love to close us in prayer, but I did want to mention just one last thing before we go. So, and I promised you at the beginning that I would talk to you about how we really activate these things. Um, and this is what it is. When the armor of God is taught, six pieces of armor are typically highlighted. You hear people talking about the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, Shoes fitted with the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. Six things. But there are actually seven aspects to your armor. And the final one is the one that activates the other six. And we see it in verse 18, Ephesians 6, verse 18. After listing all the pieces of the armor of God, St. Paul then says, and pray at all times. And this is so critical. It is prayer that actually activates the spiritual weapons, the divine armor. Prayer is what infuses it all with the divine power that brings victory in battle. So we cannot skip this. Trying to fight the spiritual battle without prayer is like trying to vacuum your living room without the vacuum cleaner plugged in. You can be moving around, but nothing much is happening. So I want us to close in prayer, but also to commit to getting serious about waging this war on our knees. We can make a difference not because we're so smart, not because we always know the right thing to say, not because we're super great at controlling things. We can make a difference when we pray and start to access divine power to stand firm against principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. But not only will we be able to stand firm we will start to take back ground that the enemy is squatting on, but does not belong to him. So let's close in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, we want to be aware of our enemy schemes, but we don't want to be so focused on him that we get discouraged by all the chaos and the division and the evil that he's causing. Because this is not a battle between two equal opponents. Only you, God, can be everywhere at once. 
Our enemy is limited in that way. Only you know all things. The enemy cannot read our minds. You are always in control. You are far more powerful. So help us to remember this, Lord, especially in those areas of our lives where it feels like the enemy has the upper hand. God, you are the one who is in control. You are at work. You are right now reshaping the very thing the enemy intends to use to take us down into something that will bring us growth and blessing. So help us to hold on to that hope and to never, ever stop battling on our knees. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thanks for listening to Hope for Right Now, a Walking with Purpose podcast. We would love for you to subscribe, share today's episode with a friend, and leave a rate and review. And don't forget, subscribe to our weekly newsletter. This is where you'll get sneak peeks into new content, special events, and exclusive discounts sent directly to your inbox. Finally, we know how important it is to keep the conversation going. So we've created a private Facebook group exclusive to listeners like you. You can find the newsletter and Facebook details all in our show notes. It's our privilege to unpack God's word with you, and we can't wait to do it again next week. Until then, friends, don't forget to open your heart, open your Bible, and invite God in.